Okay. Let's see what Nagel's argument uh, is for this view uh, before we uh, look at uh, other objections in addition to your one uh, to the view. Okay. So Nagel thinks that there are four pretty plausible claims, on the face of it at least, that we don't want to deny. Material composition, non-reductionism, realism about mental properties, and the claim that emergentism is just false. So we'll go over each of these uh, individually. So first we'll look at material uh, composition. So the claim here is, in a kind of a slightly pejorative way, that there's no fairy stuff, no ghosts, no supernatural uh, properties in the world. Anything whatever, Nagel says, if broken down far enough and rearranged, could be incorporated into a living organism. No constituents besides matter are needed. So no constituents besides matter are needed to build conscious living beings. So in a way, this comes back to your um, uh, issue that if you were to break down a human being far enough, uh, all you'd find, actually, uh, would be physical uh, components. Okay? And we'll see in a moment where the mental will creep in to this. But the basic claim here is that we're basically just materially composed. That's what we're made up of. You search around inside any human being, and that's all uh, you're going to find. Uh, and you can incorporate any uh, physical stuff into a human being. Okay, so that's a fairly uncontroversial claim. We're made up of physical stuff. Um, Non-reductionism. We've seen Nagel, of course, arguing for uh, this more comprehensively uh, in his What Is It Like to Be a Bat article, and we've seen the Mary the Colorblind Scientist um, argument from uh, Jackson. Uh, and so the claim here is, look, maybe supervenience is true, but we uh, can't reduce we're not, seemingly not able to reduce the uh, mental uh, to the physical. So the physical doesn't imply the mental. You can't derive the mental properties from uh, the physical properties. Yeah? Yeah, so the kinds of dualism that tend to be around now... Um, and that somebody like Chalmers will endorse is a form of property dualism, where he's not going for some kind of substance dualism uh, like Descartes was. And we know from having studied these issues why they're not doing that, right? I mean, the basic problem is the problem of interaction. It never went away, and it doesn't seem like it's even soluble. So, um, so the reason people don't go that way is uh, generally for something like the problem of interaction or some variant of that uh, issue. But they can go property dualist because they'll say that, uh, okay, you can have the mental supervening on the physical maybe, but you've got something weird happening where you've just got irreducible mental properties. They're not reducible to physical properties, and so uh, you end up being a dualist about the properties um, that we have in the world. And so the claim here is exactly an expression of that view. Uh, the mental properties are not physical properties. You can see, hopefully, that we're already getting into trouble here because we just said a moment ago that one claim we don't want to deny is that we're totally made up of um, uh, physical stuff. Now it's seeming a bit weird. Mental properties are not physical properties. Okay, so what do we do? Well, of course, we might deny mental properties and say, I know we talk about mental properties, but really they don't exist, and that'll give us an easy way to be... Um, Physicalists, now we don't have to reduce anything to anything. But it seems like we do have mental properties, right? So it's difficult to be uh, an eliminativist uh, about mental properties, to say that we should just eliminate uh, talk of mental properties, eliminate appeal uh, to mental properties. So that brings us to the next claim, realism about mental properties. It seems like they can't, Nagel thinks at least, be analyzed away. You can't just say they don't exist. And we don't want to say that they belong to some ghostly thing like a Cartesian immaterial 
substance or soul or whatever. Uh, so they must be real. We can't analyze them away. We can't just dismiss their existence. We can't say they belong to something weird like a uh, Cartesian soul. So they must be real. Uh, now this view, realism about mental properties, is uh, opposed to the view that I just barely mentioned a moment ago, uh, eliminative materialism, which is defended by uh, Patricia and Paul Churchland, uh, for example. So their claim uh, will be that, you know, even when this guy has a thought like um, mental properties go, okay, uh, that really that's just some shorthand convenient way we have uh, of talking about what ultimately is just a neural state. So their view will be something like this. Uh, they'll say that, look, when we eventually uh, get to the end of neuroscience and figure out how to do it entirely and we have a complete account uh, of human brains, then our common sense psychological framework uh, will be revealed to be false. Strictly speaking false, it was just useful for us to talk that way because we didn't know all the neural facts. Uh, so their idea, not to caricature it, it too much, but uh, is that eventually, um, you know, you say, oh, how are you doing today? And I say, I'm doing great, just had a nice cup of coffee. Um, that I mean, maybe expressing some mental state of mine, uh, but eventually what you will uh, be able to do is when you report that to somebody else, they say, how's Oshin today? And you'll say, well, and then you just give some big, long neural babble, okay, about uh, various uh, neural firing rates, uh, etc., and that will be hopefully comprehensible to your interlocutor. Uh, you're going to be able to say, how was Ushin today? Well, blah, 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 blah. You give a whole thing, about 10 pages worth of uh, neural, uh, neuroscience textbook, and somebody will go, oh, cool, great, great to hear that he's well. Um, so that's essentially what they believe, though. They will eventually dispense with our ordinary uh, common sense folk psychological way of talking uh, and replace it, strictly speaking, uh, with some newer framework that is just in terms of um, neuroscience. But if you don't buy that, if you think, well, no, I think we really need to talk about mental states and our folk psych psychology makes sense uh, like Nagel thinks, then you'll think that really, no, you can't. Uh, at the very least, Nagel, Nagel can say to these people, well, you haven't got there yet, so I've got no good reason to believe you. Um, for now, I'm going to be a realist about mental properties. Um, and I'm going to insist that they can't, as yet, at least be analyzed away. Uh, and by all means, they can't belong to some ghostly thing like a Cartesian soul. So they must be real. So that's what it is to be a realist here about mental properties. Any questions about that before we move on? OK. So maybe. You're not noticing it yet, maybe you are, but we're being pushed in a certain direction here, and we're going to get pushed even further. Um, emergence is still on the table, so we could say, yeah, I'm going to be a realist about mental properties. Uh, I know reductionism uh, doesn't work, uh, and I know that we're just made up of physical stuff, but I'm going to insist that when that physical stuff gets arranged in the right way, boom, like magic, uh, the mind, consciousness, mental states, etc., uh, pop into being. Okay. But Nagel thinks that that view is just false. So uh, properties, he thinks, of complex systems like human beings uh, derive from properties of their constituents and relations between them. So the emergence here is merely epistemic. And he thinks, for that reason, it's not interesting. It's not like metaphysical or ontological emergence, where something uh, actually kind of pops into being with uh, properties of its own and is not in some sense governed by the lower level laws or something like that. It's just that when we uh, look at mental states, say, we're just not able to explain how they're, um, strictly speaking, maybe governed or derivable from uh, lower level uh, states and laws. So to see how this is supposed to work, uh, I think this is a, a fairly useful example. So this is Conway's game of life. It's not really a game in the sense that you don't want to play it with somebody for the evening or anything. It won't be very interesting. Um, but you, you can look it up here. I've uh, put a link, and you can uh, start out with configurations of your own. What you do is you just sort of select a number of cells in this grid. Okay. 
Now this world uh, and this initial starting uh, state of the world uh, is such that the whole thing is governed just by two rules overall. And these are the rules. So for a space, that's just one cell here, uh, that's populated, that means it's filled in, say here by yellow. Um, for a space that's populated in this way, uh, each cell with one or no neighbors dies as if by solitude. Each cell with four or more neighbors uh, dies as if by overpopulation. So that's uh, two ways in which uh, a cell that is switched on, as it were, can switch off. And then the second rule, for each space that's empty or unpopulated, so each cell that's not colored yellow, um, each cell like that with three neighbors uh, will become populated. So that's an account of or a rule governing how uh, a cell that's not switched on will then switch on to yellow. Okay, so that's really, really simple universe. It's much easier to give the entire account of the laws of nature of this universe than it is for our own. So it's a useful example just to get clearer on things. So that's, that's an entire account of the laws of nature for this, um, for this world. And this is the initial condition, like the Big Bang of this universe here. That's the state it's in right there. Okay, so we can, um, if I can get this thing to work. We can hit it now, it started running, and this is what happens. Um, it's a kind of a thing that begins to take a life of its own like that, uh, seems to behave in a certain way. Not very interestingly in a sense because there's no uh, patterns that we can notice other than just simple operation of these rules. But if you speed it up and let it go for a little while, eventually here, and I've slowed it down. So at the top, very top thing there, and then uh, coming down here on the right, you'll see two little objects. Now those things in Conway's Game of Life are called gliders. And they behave like that, like a unified thing that's kind of flying in a, in a specific direction. And you can zoom out on the grid like I've done here, speed it up, and you can see those things flying as sort of cohesive objects. They seem to be behaving in a certain way. And those are called gliders. They seem to be kind of emergent properties of this little uh, simple world. Uh, they seem to be the kinds of things that you might want to give an account of. Like maybe we could give an account of um, we need laws, maybe, for gliders. But we don't need laws for gliders. They're just a, a thing that emerges from uh, the way this thing is working uh, and can be explained entirely in terms of these lower level laws. The emergence is merely epistemic in that way because um, in, a, in a more complex system like the, the actual world, we're, we're not able as easily to see how the behavior of something analogous to the glider namely our consciousness maybe, uh, is maybe governed by the lower level laws. But in a case like this, we can see that, in fact, even though the thing looks like it should have laws that explain it as an individual emergent entity, in fact, it can be perfectly well explained by the lower level laws. So the idea here is that um, we're just in a situation like this, and consciousness, mental properties are just analogous to the gliders, but it's just much more complex to explain how they uh, explain the behavior of, of minds and to explain mental properties in terms of the lower level things. And so it's kind of epistemically screened off from us. Uh, it's just a, the seeming emergence of consciousness is just uh, a result of our epistemic limitations. Epistemic limitations that we're not subject to in a simple case like this. Okay, so that's the claim about um, emergentism being uh, false because it's merely epistemic. And that maybe we could someday do something analogous uh, here to, uh, to this. Okay, so the four claims then we don't want to deny. Material composition, uh, we saw we're just made out of physical stuff. Non-reductionism, it seems like we haven't been able to do a good job of reducing the mental to the physical. Uh, so the physical doesn't imply the mental. Realism about mental properties, they can't be analyzed away, they can't belong to a ghostly being, so they're real. And emergentism, the properties of complex systems derive from the properties of their constituents and the relations, let's say the laws that govern, govern their behavior uh, among them. And so emergence is merely epistemic, it's not real emergence, it's just apparent emergence, in the same way that gliders apparently emerge in Conway's game of life. So where does this leave us? Well, if we can't deny any of those claims, 
then we don't have reductionism, but we have to be realists. Uh, we're only made out of physical stuff, and we can't go emergentist. The only option left, it seems like. Um, it's like an argument by claustrophobia or something. It's more like checkmate. You're getting forced into a situation where you don't really want to be. Um, so it leads to an implausible conclusion, what you might have initially thought was an implausible conclusion, panpsychism. The basic constituents of the universe have mental properties. So now there's no problem that we're made out of material stuff because uh, that material stuff has, as part of what makes it up, mental properties. Because of that, we don't have to have reductionism. Uh, because of that, we can also be realists about mental properties, and we can also say that emergentism is false. So panpsychism is, uh, panpsychism is consistent with maintaining all of these four plausible claims that we don't want to deny. Okay, so now to get back to this issue about, well, what, what does it mean to say that these mental properties are part of the physical constituents, the basic physical uh, constituents? Can't the mental properties just be physical properties then? Um, what is it to be physical? So Nagel says that uh, new properties are counted as physical if they're discovered by explanatory inference from those already in the class of uh, physical objects. And he thinks that... Um, Mental properties do, even for the panpsychist, derive from properties of the organism's constituents, but not from their physical properties. Otherwise, we'd be able to give a reductive explanation. So he thinks they must derive from non-physical properties. So if the mental properties, as he puts it in the reader, of an organism are not implied by any physical properties, but must instead derive from properties of the uh, organism's uh, constituents, then those constituents must have, in addition to their being physical, they must have non-physical properties. And from them, then, uh, the appearance of mental properties follows when the uh, combination is of the right kind. So basically, at the fundamental level, um, we're made up of physical stuff, but somehow, uh, coming along with that, are these non-physical properties. And it's not a substance dualism, so it's just properties of that physical stuff. Um, but they're non-physical properties, bizarrely. And they're right down there in the uh, fundamental goo of the universe. They're not emergent. They don't pop into being somewhere. Okay. Now, interestingly, um, we're denying emergentism here. Um, now, if emergentism is true, then there's no... Uh, psychophysical causation, so there's no mental causation. Correlation is all uh, there is. Why? Well, because uh, genuine causal relations would seem to be necessary, and to deny, as Nagel puts it, that mental properties have no causes is uh, crazy, it's preposterous. So the idea here is that um, the mental properties have got to have um, some causes, uh, there have to be causal relations there, uh, and unless we're prepared to accept the alternative of the sudden emergent appearance of mental properties in complex systems with no causal explanation at all, they just pop into being, ex nihilo, with no causal story as to why that occurred, which is essentially what he thinks emergentism is committed to, um, we must take, he thinks, instead the uh, current epistemological emergence of the mental as, not as a reason to believe in emergentism, uh, but as a, a reason to believe that the constituents at the fundamental level have properties of which we're just not aware. Uh, we haven't been aware of them, uh, which do necessitate the results. So basically, you're hypothesizing the existence of uh, the mental in the most fundamental level uh, in order to be able to explain how you get... Uh, mentality at higher levels uh, caused by those lower level uh, mental properties. Because otherwise, you've just got to say that there's no causal story to be told at all. It's just a pop story. They just pop into existence at some time, as the emergentist would claim. Okay. Um, realism about mental properties without reductive explanation. So Nagel is essentially committed to what uh, you might call a non- reductive form of physicalism, and some people will call a bit of a cheat. Um, 
His view, of course, as we've seen, is that subjective experience can only be understood fully from a particular point of view. And he thinks that the gap between the objective view of mentality or consciousness uh, that, say, science will have to adopt uh, and the subjective point of view that we have ourselves, our subjective mental properties, it's logically, he thinks, unbridgeable. Uh, and so he wants to, you might want to be a physicalist here, um, and that's an option that's open to Nagel, but he thinks that it's going to have to be a non-reductive form of physicalism. Uh, and some people, name mo mostly non-physicalists, people who for some reason want there to be emergent properties, uh, will say that non-reductive physicalism is consistent with emergentism, um, but of course not maybe with the other claims that we looked at. Uh, and another option for a form of non-reductive phys physicalism is um, panpsychism. But basically the idea here is that no description or analysis of the objective nervous system, uh, however complete, will ever by itself imply anything which is not objective. So you're never going to get um, a derivation of the mental properties of mentality from the physical. Um, okay. So just to sum up what's going on here, um, here's the whole argument put simply, Nagel's argument. Mental properties can't be properties of anything uh, but entities made up entirely of physical matter. They can't just be physical because he thinks we don't get the reduction, uh, but they're real, uh, so they have to be somewhere. Where would they be? They don't just pop up at some level, as the emergentist uh, would claim. And so the claim is they must be fundamental. It's the only option left to us. And that's the view. So we've got the basic stuff of the universe with the potential to know what it's like to taste Vegemite, to feel a tickle, to feel pain, to experience phenomenal uh, states of seeing red, and so on. But should we accept this view? Not necessarily. Um, we're left with it, uh, given the plausible assumptions that we wanted not to deny, with panpsychism as seemingly the only view that we could be left holding. But Nagel thinks it's not really a very good view. So maybe there's just no view worth holding. And that's essentially what he says. He says, panpsychism should be added to the current list of mutually incompatible and hopelessly unacceptable solutions to the mind-body problem. I remember studying philosophy for the first time. Uh, and at the same time as I was beginning to get increasingly intrigued with it, uh, I was also getting increasingly frustrated with it. I don't know, people probably come to doing philosophy with all kinds of different motivations. But I wanted to know the answers, right? I wanted to know the answers. And then every lecture I went to, I was like, great, okay, so now we're doing materialism. I don't care. If the mind is material, that'll be fine. At least I'll have the answer. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, can't be right, right? Dualism, oh, can't be right. Oh, can't be right, can't be right. And I was like, dude, like, what's the answer? Like, can you just, you know, it's not like a novel. Don't feel like you're giving away the plot, like a spoiler or something. Cut to the end and just tell me what the answer is, please. Uh, but there was no answer. My professor at the time was like, sorry, you're out of luck. You're going to have to become accustomed uh, to being in an epistemic state of uncertainty and not being resolved on an issue sometimes in philosophy where you maybe carefully and analytically lay out a survey of the options and then you just have to live with the results until something better comes along or you can make something better, a uh, particular view or theory. It just seems like all we've got, uh, according to Nagel at least, is a list of hopeless alternatives here. And we just get to add panpsychism to that list. And we still don't know what the answer is. So, sorry for leaving you in this situation, if that's what you had wanted, like I did back in the day, uh, if that's what you had wanted to know was just the answer. We don't know what the answer is according to Nagel. Now, not everybody agrees with this, of course, but that's his take on it here, that uh, we end up with a kind of mysterianism, what another philosopher calls mysterianism, about the mind. There's a bunch of views, they've all got their virtues, they've got something going for them, uh, but they all have uh, significant problems as well, he thinks. Okay, 
Well, there might be objections to panpsychism in, in any case. We'll have a look at those in a moment. But any thoughts or queries, questions, frustrations, expressions of anger at philosophy, anything? Yes. Right. So that is, in a sense, the, it's something that the non-reductive uh, physicalist seems like they have to be committed to. Uh, and it can be a form of property dualism, where you say that the only stuff there is in the universe is physical stuff. But uh, it's got uh, something weird about it because it has uh, non-physical properties, in addition to having physical properties. Um, and then you can go the various ways that we've only very briefly sketched here. You can say that uh, those properties emerge somehow at a certain level of complex organization, or you can say that they're right there in the bottom, like the panpsychist says. Um, but it's a, it's a kind of, if this helps, it's a kind, it is a kind of non-physicalism, obviously, because it says that there's something important about the world that we can't explain in physical terms. So it is a form of non-physicalism, but it's, it's sort of consistent with physicalism in a certain way because it doesn't have to be committed, like Descartes, to the existence of fundamental non-physical stuff, okay, uh, where you would then in, in any case have the problem of interaction. You can say, look, the world is made up of physical, uh, the stuff that physics is eventually going to say it's made up of. Slight issue there because we don't know that yet, but what that is. Um, but then you just get to say that because it seems like uh, you want to be realists about mental properties, but you can't give a reductive explanation uh, and so on, then you have to say that somehow they either emerge or they're there in the fundamental stuff as it is. Um, or you can go like um, uh, the, the church lands and uh, deny that really there are mental properties like that uh, uh, and that really we'll be able to talk just in terms of the fundamental, more fundamental physical stuff, in this case maybe neuroscience, uh, eventually. So it is a kind of weird view, yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of like saying that, yeah, physical is all there is, but physicalism is, in an in important respect, also false, right? Anybody else want to throw rotten tomatoes at the philosopher and say, boo, I thought you were going to give me answers? You're not. Yes, oh my god, rotten tomatoes, sorry. <laughs> Ah, re rejecting which conclusion? The conclusion of panpsychism. He says that it's the best one, but we shouldn't accept it because it sounds stupid. Yeah, good. Okay, so why is it? Why is it that he is uh, uh, rejecting it? Anyone want to weigh in on this? Yeah, okay. So, so yeah, so there are two uh, ideas on the table here. One, that he just finds it implausible or counterintuitive in some way, uh, and he thinks it, we can't really take it seriously because of that. But there might also be uh, something in, in your suggestion, which is that uh, he might think that, look, if that's true, then we've got no way of sort of confirming it uh, as a hypothesis because it's so weird, right? And so we'd be believing it then... Um, for no better a reason than you would be rejecting it if you were rejecting it intu on intuition. You'd just be sort of accepting it because why? Because you decided to or something, okay? But looking at the objections, that's the first objection here is that it's just entirely absurd, okay? It's counterintuitive. Um, and that's one reason you can have here for rejecting the view. Now the reply uh, here is not necessarily. Um, and what people will appeal to here is proto-mental properties. So 
And they'll say that the ubiquitous mental properties that are out there in the fundamental goo of the universe, they're not like the properties of uh, human minds, say. It's not like they really are going around with a kind of saying ouch uh, to themselves or something when you stand on them or whatever. Uh, but it's a proto-ouch in a sense. So there's, this is the idea of having somehow more fundamental little bits of consciousness that then somehow get, get aggregated uh, and eventually sort of make up the kind of mind or consciousness that a human would have. Um, so Nagel here in the reader says, the mental properties of all matter uh, would have to be not species specific, of course, because they're going to be proto-mental properties of all matter, uh, but universal. So they're very different then than the mental properties that we would have as members of a particular species. Um, and why? Because they would underlie all plausible forms of consciousness and so in a way that they would be less subjective then than the uh, specific forms. So they might actually be quite different mental properties than the mental properties that we have. They're proto-mental uh, properties in some sense. Okay, well, um, you might think also then that that's not much of a solution because what am I doing there? I'm saying that well, you get all these little bits of consciousness, consciousness -y stuff and then eventually when you stick them together in the right way out pops something like a human consciousness. And so it seems like we slide back to emergence. As you might think that the emergence of our mental properties from proto-mental properties is just as bad as the supposed emergence of mental properties from uh, purely physical properties. Now the reply of people who want to endorse some kind of property dualism here, uh, although Chalmers doesn't necessarily endorse uh, panpsychism, um, but the reply Chalmers gives here is, well, it's not necessarily as bad. The gap, maybe, that uh, logically unbridgeable gap that Nagel was talking about, uh, the gap between proto-mental and mental properties might not be the same. It might not be as wide okay, as the gap between um, physical and mental properties. So let's wait and see, although what would be involved in seeing here is not clear. Uh, but the suggestion here is that it might not be quite as bad. But to say that it's not quite as bad is to still say that it's bad, right? Um, so it doesn't seem to entirely escape the objection. If you start appealing to uh, proto-mental properties, it seems like it's going to be difficult to get out of having to be committed to some kind of emergence. The emergence now of mental properties like ours from these supposed proto-mental uh, properties.